In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. So, of course, I just got back this week from a, uh, a rather last-minute visit to Hawaii to uh, visit my father, who, as I announced uh, three weeks ago, or I guess it was, uh, has Parkinson's and uh, has gotten to the point where he can no longer care for the family farm and decided to sell it and to, to move to the mainland where he has better access to medical care and so on and uh, closer family and friends. Um, so it was a bittersweet trip. It was a trip to say goodbye to the old place that my, uh, my um, grandparents had, had built and, and as well as to spend some time with my father while his health still allows him to do a lot of, a lot of the things that uh, are a joy to do. So I took Henry and we went to Hawaii. Now, this isn't a story about that. This is a story, though, about joy. And so to illustrate joy, I want to talk about a beach in Hawaii, a particular beach, my family's favorite beach, which is called Makalavana. The thing about Makalavana Beach, one of the things that makes it so awesome is that it's a very difficult beach to get to. Uh, you have two choices to get to Makalavana Beach. You can either walk in or you can drive in. Walking in requires going across some fields of hot lava, well, not hot as in like out of the volcano hot, but hot from the beating sun down that comes down on you, uh, across about, it's about 1.5 kilometer walk. And that's a really hard walk to do when you've got young ones. So your other choice is you can drive in. To drive in, you need a serious four-wheel drive vehicle. And you need the confidence to be able to drive that vehicle across some very rough land. Now, I'm not a complete newbie at driving four-wheel drive vehicles across rough land, but I have to say that on this trip, it absolutely stretched me to the limit of my confidence and ability with that vehicle. So I, I had this Jeep, and I was going down this path, and at one point, there was a, 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 like a cliff drop-off of about two or three feet. And if you go across that and your front wheels go down, you could easily smash the oil pan under your car, destroy the oil pump, and burn out your engine in just a matter of minutes. So I had to get out of the car, and I had to take lava rocks and pile them at the base of this little cliff until I had enough clearance to, to clear it with the four-wheel drive. And there were two or three other times where I had to get out of the vehicle and take a look and kind of scratch my head and figure out how I was going to get through this. The whole time, Henry was in the back seat, by the way, just bouncing around, bouncing around. <laughs> I think he was having a good time. Anyway, it takes about 45 minutes to drive the four-wheel drive Jeep path to this beach. And once you get there, you park, and then you still have to walk like another 100 meters or so to get to the actual beach. But once you do, you're rewarded with one of the best beaches in the world. And it's not just me saying that. That's what people say about this beach. You read it in the tourist guides. It's one of the best beaches in the world. It has just the right combination of the softest coral sand you can imagine, along with some beautiful lava outcroppings of, of black rock that provide a, a pleasing contrast. There are even a few picnic tables there, and no tourists. Needless to say, the 1.5 kilometer trek across hot lava prevents the casual tourist from making it. And few would dare take a rental vehicle across that four-wheel drive path. Therefore, the people that show up at McAlevina Beach are the insiders the people that know what they're in for, who arrive there and make the difficult journey because they're looking for the deep joy that comes from a perfect beach. I had diligently brought my beach chair, set it up, cracked open a beer, local IPA, put it in the thing next to me, and watched Henry as he played in the surf. That, my friends, is deep joy, holy joy. I explained to Henry that this is, in fact, a sacred place. Uh, there's all kinds of signs on the edge of the beach where it meets the land saying kapu, which is Hawaiian for forbidden because these are sacred lands to the Hawaiian people. They're what they call queen's baths, which are these brackish ponds with tiny little fish in them that are sacred to those people. So I explained to Henry this was a sacred place, and I said to him, you know, Henry, salt water heals everything, whether it comes in the form of sweat, blood, tears, or sea. There's a deep power when you sit in the surf and you feel the elemental forces washing against your body. Henry, of course, responded intuitively like a child would, he kept wanting to go to the beach again and again and again. Needless to say, we only went to Makalavana once, but we went to many other beaches as well, and he enjoyed them all. He loved to stand in the surf and feel it come up against his body, try to do taekwondo against the waves that were raging. There's something about the deep joy that comes from that kind of harmony. Jesus speaks of joy, of course, as well. He says that our joy will be complete when we follow his command to love one another. Joy was an odd thing to talk about at that time. This is part of the farewell discourses, those last chapters of John that precede the passion narrative. This is his final instructions to his students. He's talking about joy 
on the occasion of his death. He says that that joy will require a love which is self-sacrificing in character. What does that mean? One way to understand it might be that if Jesus is the vine and joy is the fruit of that vine, then the sacrifice, the loving sacrifice, is the soil in which that vine grows, a, a necessary but perhaps unfortunate or unpleasant aspect of the whole process. If you want to experience joy, just take a look at the book of Acts. It's got to make the heart of any Christian rejoice. You know, you read the, the especially the first umpteen chapters of, the, of the, the book of Acts, which is the second part of Luke's gospel, and you just have this sense of this exploding church. This is growing so fast on fire with the Holy Spirit in ways that none of the people who are part of that could understand. Like the waves on the beach, they're swept up in this moment of great joy and elemental forces at work, tossing them around in the seas of uncertainty, but yet all the same feeling such joy. I mean, take a look at Peter's reaction here, what he experiences uh, in the book of Acts in our lesson today. Right before it, you see, he had had this vision, this strange vision for a, a Jewish uh, person who was adherent to the law, uh, this vision that God was somehow making all creation, all animals clean. It was like a, a white sheet, he explained, that sort of came down and covered everything. And a voice came to him and said, kill and eat. And he's like, no, no, I, I would never do that. I would never eat anything unclean. But God's pretty insistent. And then shortly after that, he's called to visit this man's house, Cornelius. He is described as a God-fearer, as one who maybe didn't adhere to all the tenets of Judaism and all the laws, and was certainly not circumcised, but he was one who nonetheless meant to be righteous and was a patron of, of many good causes and helped people, it seemed. And so he, Peter was asked to visit him. And in that encounter with this man, he is crossing many boundaries, uh, not just cleanness and uncleanness, but this is uh, an officer of the Roman imperial military. That's not normally someone who a Jewish person would want to associate with in ancient Palestine. I can't really think of a, a similar parallel except to think of one of our enemies of our culture, maybe Al-Qaeda or something like that. I mean, imagine if we were asked to, to sit down with a terrorist and talk about God's love, how difficult that would be for us. It's a similar thing here for Peter. So Peter makes a loving sacrifice to cross the boundaries that he had grown up with and to sit down with this person. The word in the text, which is translated here as without hesitation, could also be translated as without discrimination very intriguing way to understand what's being called for in this, in this lesson, that we are without hesitation, without discrimination to go into the house of one who normally we would consider to be other, to be unclean, to be violent, to be something we should be afraid of. And what does he find when he does that? What does he experience? Nothing other than the blessing of God and his love. Nothing other than the holy joy that can come serving God and being in harmony with those waves. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they invited him to stay for a few days. Sorry, several days. Imagine what those several days were like. The joy in that household. The transformation they had experienced. Not just Cornelius and his family, but Peter too, who is experiencing a new kind of freedom a new kind of joy in what God's abundant grace has done, the way that it has overflowed past any bounds he thought had been placed on it. Beloved, we are called to similar joy. And the path to get here from there is bumpy, and it requires perhaps a specialized vehicle to get us there. Perhaps it requires a certain amount of courage, and every once in a while we might have to get out of the vehicle, the church, and pile a few stones in front of it just so that we can cross through to the other side. But, beloved, if we can have that courage, the courage of Peter, who went to a very difficult place as well, we will find in that place great joy. We will find that place great harmony and peace in following the grace of God and being in his love. Jesus said, wrong lesson. <laughs> Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He says in another place, if you keep my commandments, the commandment to love, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. Friends, for Jesus calls us friends, we are called to accept nothing less than the complete joy that we have in the freedom of Christ.
And now as I do, I'll open this up. Anyone has any thoughts, reflections? Let's go to the joy place. Anyone have any thoughts on joy? For example, how would you describe, and this is an a question I don't have an answer to this one, <laughs> the difference between joy and happiness? You know, when I was uh, young, my experience with joy was, you know, so simple. Today, I like, you know, fancy computers, fancy phones and stuff. But I remember that when I was young, you know, I used to sit with my uncles to look at the canaries to sing. And that, you know, was something I would, you know, be looking forward to do, you know, every day in the morning. I would wake up and run, you know to the canaries and put the canaries and clean and look at them. That gave me so much joy. And today I saw, a f uh, you know, uh, a golden finch and I stopped. I, I got late to the church. <laughs> so I stopped just to look at the finch, like it gave me so much joy. And sometimes we think about so many fancy things, so many great things and travels, uh, trips, travels and uh, possessions. And sometimes joy, you know, is something so small there that is there for you you know just to enjoy i think joy often has that surprising quality you know it sort of surprises us and can even arrest us in our tracks right yeah cameron um just in, in reading the psalms i've been really struck by the imagery that he uses often um like the trees uh, skipping like lambs and the and the hills just like like flying, like it, it's like this perception of wonderment and um, yeah, surprise, like surprise at how beautiful things are and at how um, tremendous uh, God is to us. And I think for me, happiness is a sort of a mild elation that I get when I get things my way usually, you know, and it passes pretty quickly. Joy also passes quickly, but it's got more to do with my entire perceptual apparatus. It's all involved in it. I think that joy is a kind of innocence. It's something, uh, it's a very simple feeling, but it's not something that happens very often. You can see it in children when they experience something new for the first time, or just the, how excited they get over something. It's, joy is not just a feeling that you get, you know, when something good has happened to you in a day. It's a feeling that you get when you experience something that is truly wonderful and miraculous. So. In that sense, I think it's, I think what children see every day is very much joy. They're not just simply happy, but because of their innocence, they truly are joyful a lot of the time. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, who was it that wrote um, about the first and second innocence? Was that Bonhoeffer? Somebody may know that scripture. Do you remember, John? Or somebody, anybody else? Okay, I don't remember. Anyway, one of the theologians of our tradition talks about first and second naivete, meaning that like children have their first naivety. Right? And then we all be very bitter and critical, right? And it's somehow to get back to the kind of childlike quality of experience in the world that Jesus talks about, we have to kind of enter into a second naivety, right? And, and how we do that is, yeah, that's about as much as I can remember of that reflection. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as it would happen, this is a, the very topic we were discussing last week in, in Sunday school, the difference between joy and, and, and happiness and, and uh, joy being one of the, the fruits of the Spirit. Happy, on the other hand, of course, has the same root as the word happen. Happy, what, when you, ask, you want someone to be happy, you're, you're asking good things to happen to them. You're asking for external things to influence their mood. So happy is something that happens to you when things outside happen to you. Joy, being a part of the fruit of the Spirit, actually is something that's inside a person. And I think, I think that's, I'm, I'm agreeing uh, with what was just said, because uh, children have a natural joy that, that comes out of them. So joy is something that, as we get older, and it's not as natural as it is to a child, that, that's something we need to pray for that God will enable to come out of us. Not that good things will happen to us, but we will be the, the kind of person that, that other people will see joy within. Thank you. That's a very good distinction. Yeah. Um, 
it was uh, there's a theologian Tex Sample. I attended a talk he did one time in which he. Oh, sorry, was somebody okay? Uh, just sorry. Um, the text Sample. He he was summarizing the work of other people, but he basically argued that if you if you want to experience joy, then you have to change the way you perceive the world, yourself, others. And the way to do that is you have to sort of train the senses. And you do that by basically, it's like, it's like you have to constantly encounter the joy, right? You have to, so in the case of, of if, if you want to experience childlike joy, you kind of have to hang out with children, right? Uh, at least that seems, or at least childish people. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> Uh, speaking of the childlike joy or the second innocence, the first reading um, where Peter has this experience of a kind of overflowing presence of the spirit among both the circumcised and uncircumcised. I mean, Peter has a great reputation for being impetuous and sort of not thinking things through and perhaps being a little more spontaneous than the others. Um, but this seems like a very really joyful moment for Peter and for everyone around him, and a great model of what that could look like, a very generous joy. Thank you. Sure. I think it was interesting what you said about uh, taking a journey, and, and, and at the same time what Betsy was saying about presence. And it struck me that, uh, that, that somehow or other you needed to take this journey in order to be present to, your, uh, to yourself, to allow that, uh, that, that joy to well up. And sometimes I think you don't have to take an external journey. Even just to stay in a place is a, is a journey in and of itself to allow yourself to become present. So it's, I think joy and presence have, uh, have some kind of link together at any rate. It, it's one of the, the foundational principles of, of Benedictine spirituality is, is stability, right? But ironically, it's st stability is one of them, and another one is conversion of life. And the way those two things in practice work together is you're basically supposed to stay in one place, committed to one community, and not just go about every time the fancy strikes you to, you know, things get uncomfortable, I'm bailing, you know, I'm out of here, right? No, 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 you're supposed to stay and stick it out, right? And um, so is that, but then somehow, paradoxically, in that stability comes a kind of conversion, you know, comes a change, right? And so what you're talking about is exactly, I think, true, that, you know, you, you sort of stay in one place, and if you can open your mind, open your eyes, and you experience that joy. Yeah, and so it can be an internal journey. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Maybe one or two others? Yeah, Trent. I confess that I wasn't sure where you were going with the, like, no tourists on the beach, because it seemed like, at first, exactly opposite to the first reading. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> everybody's included. But, I mean, I think you brought it around to the idea that it's, it's there for everyone, and and I think part of what you're saying is that that God gives us what we need to get to get to the beach. It's not going to be easy to get to the beach, but God God gives us. We we have the rocks that we have to get over, and we have the rocks that are there that will help us get over those other rocks. Yeah, I mean, there's an aspect to the joy which. It requires some kind of participation on our parts, right? Especially because that second naivete or something has to be reestablished. It's no longer, so people have said, it, it's no longer intuitive to us to experience that same joy for some reason. And so, thing that has to happen there. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't use the word outsider. <laughs> I mean, I mean, tourist. I should have used males. <laughs> I was just trying to set the scene. You know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. More, Brenda. I should probably just give a nod to Mother's Day. I can say from experience, there is no joy like when you finally give birth to that child and it's over and you hold that child and it's so miraculous and that's, you can't compare that joy to anything else. Um, my mom actually called her last 
my, my little sister, Catherine Joy, Catherine being pure. And uh, we were never too sure if it was because it was her last baby that she was so joyful. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm no longer allowed to use childbirth as a metaphor in sermons, so I stayed away from it today. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I mean, that is even a biblical metaphor. Um, um, I forget exactly where, but I believe Jesus does use that, you know, that sense of joy as well of the birth. At least I'm having a shadow of a memory that that is in there somewhere. But um, yeah, there's absolutely. And it's funny, you know, of course, they say at least that women don't remember the pain because we can't really remember we experience pain. We remember that we were in pain, but we don't re actually re-experience the pain. But the joy does sort of abide. Yeah. Anybody else? Sarah, yeah. I just want to make a comment about the second second naive, naivete you were talking about. Um, and I, I, I guess there's two things. One, one has to want to get to that point. And then I think um, as a musician and a performer and being in the performing arts, like you have to be in that second innocent child like frame of mind all the time in order to be vulnerable and then have people recognize themselves in you when you're performing and that is makes a connection so I think that the trick is to for most most adults to realize that they can do that they they just don't know if they do realize that that they have the power to step into it through cre through, through creativity <laughs> And, and often one of the ways to help grown-ups get there is actually through the use of humor. Uh, joy can often come also from play, you know? So if you can get grown-ups to be playful, right? And so you have to sort of reduce the consequences of mistakes, right? And then and get them to kind of open up a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just, uh, it's more like a question than a comment, I guess. but. You know how the frequency, they talk about a frequency scale and like gratitude and joy is like the highest and then, and then things like uh, hate and all of that is at the lower end, is at the lowest level. And they say that, well, God's like infinite, like he's, and then people like Mother Teresa are high. And then, um, you know, and then you can, you can think of examples that could be low, but um, so, but happy, happiness is not there. Joy is. Joy is up there with gratitude, but happiness is not on that scale. So I just, just, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I guess it's a more of a question slash comment, observation. <laughs> yeah, so a distinction between happiness and joy, yeah. I like, I like Brendan's thing about how happiness is about something that sort of happens to you, right, whereas joy comes from, from within, yeah, exactly. Wonderful, well, thank you all very much for your comments. So we'll continue our service by saying an affirmation of faith. Let's rise together as you are able. <laughs> 